and you're listening to Fallen Out. I'm Raymond. I'm John, and welcome back to season two. Season two of Fallen Out. Can you believe it? We made it all the way to season two. They they renewed us. Yes. For a second season. I can't believe it. We all and all we have to thank is you, the viewers, uh, the bot crew out there. We love you and our sponsor. Uh, NordVPN, you know, if you, as a robot myself, um, sometimes I'm trying to access the cloud cause like they'll like ask me a question and obviously I'm a robot. So my, I don't have a brain. Uh, you can't answer some of those questions now. Yeah. Um, so I have to access the cloud, which re- requires the internet and I don't want the freaking government to know what I'm thinking about. So you got to get NordVPN. It's perfect. There you go. That's our sponsor. Exactly. Totally sponsor. Mm-hmm. Totally one that we actually got. Yep. You can go to NordVPN VPN dot com slash uh, I'm not a robot uh, and you get fifteen percent off your first purchase. Exactly. Exactly. Well, we this is season two because we are officially back in Blacksburg. Back in black. Back in black. Spurg. I hit my spack. Mm hmm. I don't know what else I'm going to say next. So Mm -hmm. we're just going to give you the rundown of what we're going to say and talk about in this exciting action season two, episode one, season opener. So first we got to talk about what's going on with Andrew Luck. Then we'll hit up some baseball talk, usually with some, the Nats, um, talk a little about the NL East. Then we'll start to talk a little bit about the beginning of college football. Season 150, as ESPN is doing it, and Mm -hmm. they're trying to get as much money as they can out of college football before they, um, the NCAA dies. Yep. And then our favorite segment, Who Fouled Out? And then we have a change to our other favorite segment, Three Big Questions. Which we'll see at the end. It will. We are going to keep you waiting. Sort of like, Mm -hmm. you know, you're hanging on to like the edge of a cliffside. Yeah. You know, if there was only a literary term. Yeah. That could be used to describe that. Unfortunately, none of us are English majors, so no one could know. <sighs> that is unfortunate. If you are a, a continual listener, you will know that one of us is an English major. But no. you know, you know, got well, got to brighten it up for you know the new viewers who may be coming in for oh, the new yeah. season. Because it's a new season, it's, it's just still like, dreaming, as Drake would say. Yeah, exactly. You know, like The Office. You know, season one only had six episodes, and not that many people saw it. But then season mm-hmm. two is when yeah. it really got started. Exactly, and that's what's going to happen with us. Yes, yeah, exactly. You know, we had. 104 listeners one episode yeah. we're gonna get 204 listeners and then a thousand exactly and 200 thousand mm-hmm. and then it'll all, one million it, yeah exactly you know just keep going and it'll all be in like even increments yeah like the first time <laughs> there, there will be a, an exact number of people that watch it exactly so well let's get started in with the the big news of the week this just happened last night unreal um as i was watching the miami florida game um I saw it pop up on the on the, the, the bottom line usually, you know, yeah. you know, ESPN they usually have the scores. Breaking news. Red, Andrew Luck announces retirement from the NFL. Excuse me. Excuse me, sir. This this is impossible. I like honestly I thought it was a I thought it was a joke. Yeah. Like maybe like oh Adam Schefter just screwed up. Maybe, yeah. you know, some his kid got his phone or something and just yeah. announced this to the world. Mm-hmm. And then it popped up again. I'm just like, Oh my god, it's real. It's yeah. real. It's incredible, dude. I mean, what what can you say? Andrew Luck was part of that um, 2012 draft class. You look at the first round picks. Um, you had Andrew Luck, RG three, uh, Ryan Tannehill, Brandon Whedon. People were talking about this draft class as potentially being one of the greatest draft classes um, in uh, the recent era. Um, because obviously you had, you know, Russell Wilson, right? He yep. won a Super Bowl. Third rounder. RG3 had come in and shown a lot of promise his rookie season, one yep. rookie of the year. He was one of those first dual threat quarterbacks yeah. to really make a big, or at least theoretically have the potential to make big strides in the NFL. Mm-hmm. And then Andrew Luck, obviously, you know, a consensus number one pick. Constantly um, talked about as having like some of the best natural talent I've, as we've seen like Aaron Rodgers. Oh, yeah. That like... Analysts like Colin Coward have placed him up on that tier. Yeah, he was unreal. And he showed it. I mean, he did throw a lot of picks his rookie season, but he showed that he was 
a franchise quarterback. Yeah. The only thing that kept the Colts above water. Yeah, and they had been struggling since Manning had left um, to go to the Broncos, uh, and that's why they got the number one overall pick, and they got uh, Andrew Luck. So it's crazy to hear at 29 years old, obviously he's someone that had been struggling with injuries throughout his career. He played seven seasons or was he, he in the league for seven seasons, missed one entire season due to injury. He only played four total, like complete seasons yep. in that span. Um, struggled a lot with injuries. He had a lacerated kidney, uh, shoulder problems, his calf injury recently. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was something he would go through rehab and then immediately injure himself again and have to go through it again, be playing through pain. Uh, and I guess for him, it just got to the point where the money and his love of the game was gone. The money wasn't worth it uh, to him. He just wanted the mental reprieve. Yeah, and honestly, I I don't blame him. You know, because you have you got to think about like, okay, what would I do in this in this circumstance? You know, I'm going through this uh, painful cycle, as he said, of you know, um, injury, pain, rehab, injury, pain, rehab. Um, and if you if you're focusing like, especially now you're 29, like you. you you know, you're out of your prime days in, in terms of just, you, you know, your physique. You're wanting to settle down. You're wanting to, you know, buy that home with the white picket fence. You know, you're you're buying the farm, as they say. Yeah. You know, um, but you sort of want that lifestyle of, you know, relaxed, calm, you know, I, I starting a family and stuff. And he looks at it. It's just like, okay, I've made enough money. I've saved it enough. You know, I... I, I can go on and be an analyst. I can go on and do a whole bunch of things. Coach, um, you know, these football players have, a, after they retire, if they're good or if they had like some promise, they can go on to be good coaches or um, announcers or something like that. So he's sort of looking at this from a very reasonable perspective. And I, I don't blame it at all. The only thing that I have a problem with in this decision is the timing. This is one. Of, this is the worst timing. Like yeah. right in the middle of – Week three of the preseason, two weeks before your first game. I mean, game. it was during a Colts game, during a Colts preseason yep. game. I, most players probably didn't. They were playing the game. They didn't know. Um, I will say you said he was in the – he's past his prime. I would disagree with that. I think 29 is when you really start to see great quarterbacks come into their own and become that elite, uh, you know – uh, sort of spearhead for the offense. I meant prime for people in general. Oh, like just like like, like just physical prime. Like you know yeah, your twenties. You know especially early twenties. Yeah, er, early mid twenties. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean I guess yeah. Because after twenty two, for men at least, you know it, it all starts to go downhill. Oh, thanks. I'm turning twenty two uh, in a month. So. Mm. Oh wow! You just told the whole world and our listeners how old you are. I'm wow. Twenty one. Now the government knows. The that. FBI knows. I mean, the government should know. I have a social security card. Yeah, that you'll never get any social security from. Anyway. Oops. Let's go over some of the statistics of what Andrew Luck um, left with the Colts. So, over seven seasons, he played 86 games. Sixty uh, percent completion rate, which is some, which is a rate that some quarterbacks nowadays would die for. Mm-hmm. Um, Twenty-three thousand six hundred seventy-one yards. And 171 touchdowns to 83 picks. Good 2-to-1 ratio there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously he's a gunslinger. He does tend to throw a I know, decently high clip of interceptions, but that's who he is. Who, he makes great passes, and he takes risks. Yeah, and can you name, like, one good running back that the Colts have had in the past seven seasons? Um, Frank Gore. <laughs> Didn't they? Had, they did, did they have Frank Gore, Gore for They a did, while? yeah. yeah. Um, Anybody else? Uh <sighs> Exactly. No, they they they've had some shit back in in the backfield. And he gave them four eleven and or three eleven and five seasons, and he just came off a ten and six season, yeah. which they went to the playoffs again. Mm-hmm. So, I I mean, he, when I said like he's the only reason why this franchise is afloat, I, yeah, like yeah. their 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 quarterback coming up next is Jacoby Brissett, who went one and one in his. Brief stint with the pl- uh, Jacoby Patriots. Brissett, wolf, part of the Wolf Pack, brother. Yeah, but I don't think he'll win many games, and especially um, the Colts, even though they're in the AFC South, which is pretty god awful. Um, I, I honestly don't. Th- I think they'll get swept by the Texans. They have a good chance of getting swept by the Titans. 
I it's think they'll get rough. one against the Jags, but then again, you know, big dig Nick's in charge down there now. Yeah, anything's possible. Um, yeah, it's um, it's going to be a culture shock uh, for the Colts, who, even though they haven't had a ton of postseason success, um, were a team that always had a lot of hope. They were looking to the future. They had Andrew Luck at the helm. It was getting the right pieces to be a contender. Because really the hardest thing for a team is to find that quarterback that you can win a Super Bowl with or a quarterback that can win you a Super Bowl. Mm. And I would put Luck in that category. Given enough pieces, uh, he can win you a Super Bowl. And we'll be discussing that from like a general management standpoint later on in um in our last segment. Um, because there's, there's just so much to unpack with the legacy of Andrew Luck and what could have been yeah. if management had done a good job. We'll, yeah. Yeah. We'll, we're, we'll take a, a gander at that, that question later on. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sort of, I sort of have a little bit of, you know, a reason in my head. Yeah. Um, but yeah, well, as you know, as the, uh, English literary term that we should be coming up with somebody hanging off the side of the cliff, what are they going to do? Ooh. But I think it's called in media res. I think I believe that's the technical term. I don't know what the in, in media res is. That, is that Latin? Yes, actually, I think it is. Um, it means in the middle. Oh, but that it, that the joke is that's not what you were talking about. Oh yeah. Um, but yeah, I think this Andrew Luck situation is a forewarning to all other um, GMs and owners. If you get a guy like Andrew Luck, don't fuck around. Do not waste your time. Be willing to spend that money. And, like, you got to put guys around him that can succeed because you don't know how long you have. And if you risk playing your guy hurt, you're sort of robbing Peter to pay Paul in that situation. Like, you're leveraging your future for the present and you see in this case it just didn't pay off yep and most of the time it doesn't pay off like exactly. look at the packers right now mm-hmm. like they have nobody other than maybe like what Devonte adams yeah and that's good their defense is god awful and yeah. it's just rogers is frustrated they got rid of mccarthy but you know this, this is a this is a very important year for exactly. the Packers because Rodgers is you know he's getting up there in age. You don't know how many seasons he has left. Exactly. Now we could talk NFL all day. I know we that we're, we're we're both NFL heads over here. We could talk about cows until they come home, but mm-hmm. we got to talk about the MLB now. We do have to talk a little bit about the MLB, and I know you want to talk about your Nats, so. Unfortunately, they're my adopted team. Yeah. I can't say, like Red Sox are my bandwagon. Team, so. Um, but yeah, the, the, hey, I l- fucking live in DC. Okay, okay. Well, I don't live in DC. I live just outside of DC. But anyway, Nats have been doing well, but unfortunately for them, Braves have been doing almost as well. They're on an eight-win streak right yeah. now. Um, so g- give me a little bit of a breakdown of what's going on in this NLE. So let's let's take it from the top first, and let's talk about the Braves and the Nats. Yeah, so the Braves and the Nats, both teams have been absolutely on fire in these last few weeks. Um, the Nats went into this stretch against the Pirates and the Cubs, hoping to come out with, you know, hopefully five or six wins, and that's exactly what they did. They went 6-1 and one yep. in the, the two. Should have gone 7-0. and oh. it, Very close to going 7-0. Oh. We'll get to that later. Yeah. Um, in everyone's favorite segment. Um, but you got to look at this and say, they're still six games behind how they have played about as good baseball as I've seen them play probably since that, like 10 win streak they had back in like, what, like 2014. I, I can't remember the exact year, but it was, there's a lot of hype around the team. They had a bunch of walk-off wins. There's a lot of promise in the air a lot of aspirations of uh you know playing deep into october and it, honestly um uh, i've watched the nats pretty much since like 2010 and this is probably the best they've played in uh august that i've seen in a long time um and i would say they don't have the same talent on this squad as they have in previous years but they are playing well right now which is what you need 
uh, you want to get hot at the right time. Um, and they got to just continue this into September. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like they're going to be able to catch the Braves, although they got, I think, seven more games uh, that they get against the Braves. Those are going to be big games yep. because it seems like no one else is able to beat the Braves. So Not even you, the Dodgers, yeah. You want a job done right, you got to do it yourself. And, I mean, the Nats, looking forward, we're like right now, there's the the next series. They do have a very easy series with the uh, the. The Orioles coming up. Yeah, and then they got the Marlins after that. So yeah. this week should be a very good week for the Nats. So, yeah, they should definitely continue their winning ways going forward. I don't know exactly who the Braves have up next, um, but it's looking good. The Nats did look very good in their sweep against the Cubs as they they managed to somehow pull it out today. Although I do have to say their bullpen looks dangerously bad. Like yeah. extreme, that is something that could definitely haunt them going forward. Oh, yeah, it absolutely will. It, unless... Doolittle comes off this IL stint. He comes out, and he's back to his old self. I mean, he's still, I believe, top five uh, in the uh, National League in saves. He's a good closer, and I know I, we talked about this before. He is a good closer, but um, if he can't be the guy in the ninth, and it has to be Hudson in the ninth, there's going to be issues because Strickland is good. He did give up a home run today, but he is a good seventh eighth inning guy but who do you put in that eighth inning spot it's been the worst inning for the nationals this entire year it's been where they've blown games because for the most part Doolittle has been consistent they've always had rodney who's been you know okay he struggled today uh pretty heavily um but it's that eighth inning spot that they need to find the guy and that was hudson and hudson has been very good but if he has to get moved to the ninth then who goes there who knows? I, and it's going to be an issue. Yeah, and Martinez is going to have to figure that out going forward, especially for what what it looks like to be a one game wild card. Although mm-hmm. they they probably will have the dominant starting pitching, they're going to have to you rely on them really hard. Maybe send them like seven innings, eight innings, you know, in, in yeah. case like they don't want to blow a lead, especially if it's a tight game. But then yeah. again, Martinez, if it's a tight game, I'll oh, just put you know put Swero out there. Yeah, who cares? Who gives a shit? <laughs> Who cares? It's a tie game. Don't put in your good pitcher. Exactly. So uh, moving on, going to the third place team in the NL East, but somehow a team that's favored to make the playoffs less than the fourth place team in this division. The Phillies had a, a recent struggle this week against the Marlins. Um, although they did sweep both the Cubs and the Red Sox, um, they lose both series to the Padres and the Marlins, some of the worst teams in baseball right now. Yeah. I. It's um, – if you're – Phillies fan, it's just got to be frustrating because um, the NL East, has, the Marlins are the punching bag for the rest of the NL East. This is a year where you have four competitive teams in, yeah. in the National League. And when that happens, a lot of your division play is going to be tough. You're not going to be sweeping a ton of teams. Uh, I know the Nationals got a lot of sort of flack um, back in 2012 to like 2014, 15, oh, yeah. when um, it was really the Phillies were pretty bad, Marlins were bad, the Braves Met, were bad. That yeah, yeah. Braves were generally bad. I mean, pretty much all four teams except for the Nationals were bad. Um, and that was before the Mets made the World Series yeah. against the Royals. Yeah, mm-hmm. and even in that season, it was just the Nats and the the Mets. The other three teams didn't really compete. But this year, you have four teams that are competitive, so you got to win those games against the Marlins, who aren't. Um, if you want to be able to bolster that win record and hopefully propel yourself into the you know first or second place in the division, and the Phillies can't do that. They have struggled against the Marlins all year. And it's going to come back to bite them, I think. I think they will miss the playoffs because they have a losing record against the Marlins. If they had been even competent, winning 60% of their games, they are in a totally different position. They're on the inside looking out instead of the outside looking in. Wait, isn't it the outside looking in instead of the inside looking out? What? Aren't you on the outside looking in? They want to get into the playoffs? Yeah, no, that's what I mean. I say if they were winning their games, ah. they would be on the inside looking out instead of the outside looking in like they are right now. Totally misunderstood you yeah. there. I apologize. The Luckily, fam- our robot viewers don't have an issue with that. They uh, they parse everything to a T. There's no miscommunication. Exactly. Yeah, they hear everything the first time and boom. Yeah, boom. This is just response. redundant to them. Yeah. So, yeah, Philly struggling against the Marlins. 
Now let's bring up the Mets, who were the red, the, the red hot team. When I was up in New York, they were just saying, "Oh yeah, the Mets are red hot." I was seeing a whole bunch of Mets hats out there. You know, people mm-hmm. riding this riding this wave. Yeah. Um, got swept by the Braves though. Yeah. One in five against the Braves in these last two series that they played. So, mm-hmm. it, well, can they still make the playoffs? According to ESPN, they still have a forty-two percent chance of making the playoffs. I mean, they swept the Indians. That's a good team that they swept. Yeah. The thing is, though, are they better? Do they have a better September lined up than the Cubs do or the Brewers? Yeah. It's um, it's going to come down to, I think, the – I don't know if they played the, uh, the Braves anymore, but it's going to come down to the last few series they have against their indiv- the, the teams that are in the division because those are the teams they're going to be fighting for uh, spots in the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Uh, exactly. So they got to win those games. Especially games against Marlins, games against Phillies. The Phillies will probably be the most important one. Yeah. Um, and then maybe taking a few from the Nats as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just hoping that the, the Cubs or the Brewers beat each other up and then maybe that the uh, the Mets can get on top. Um, they definitely have good pitching, like Cindergaard, DeGrom. Um, mm-hmm. Those guys are definitely quality pitchers that can make a... Um, that can make a challenge to some of the pitchers that the Nats can put up, like Scherzer and Strauss. Yeah. Um, I think the Mets are in a very similar position to the Nats, where they are actually a team that is built well to play a one-game wild card because they have two aces. Mm-hmm. Syndergaard and DeGrom are a 1A, 1B. I Well, I think DeGrom is handily better than Syndergaard, but Syndergaard would be the number one on a lot of other teams. Yeah. Um, Which is why I think the Cubs and the Brewers are at a disadvantage because they don't have the quality aces that the Nats and the Mets have. Yeah. Um, so that's why I think whoever the Nats play in their wild card, um, the Nats will have a better chance in the long mm-hmm. run. We'll talk a little bit more about this in our second favorite segment. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's the NL East right now. Braves up six games. Nats are in second. Uh, Phillies in third. I think, are they tied with the Mets? I think they're tied with the Mets for third. Uh, yes, I believe so. And then Marlins are just, I don't know how, 20, 25, 30 games behind? Dumpster fire team. Yeah, dumps, yeah. It's pretty much like my Pirates. Mm-hmm. Who did get a win today somehow. Yay. They, they, they were up, I think, like 8-0 or, or, uh, they won 14 nothing two nights ago. And then they were up like 8-0 today and then gave up seven runs. I'm just like, Jesus Christ. Um, but anyway, moving on to our next segment, and this is the first time we get to talk about this segment, Yay. college football. Ooh, it's back. It made its grand kickoff uh, yesterday with an old rivalry uh, between um, Miami, Florida, and the University of Florida. Mm-hmm. The, um, U the U versus the Gators. Versus FU. Or- F- <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay. That's a good one. Yeah, although they do always say UF, you know, and we're mm-hmm. the University of Florida. No. I shouldn't mm, talk down to them. F-U. They're very good. Yeah, yeah. But hey, F you, I don't care. Yeah. Um. So yeah, this was a game ACC versus SEC. SEC always likes to think that they're the big brother to the ACC. Um. However, recency may you know change that over time, especially with Clemson. However, the SEC is by far the deeper conference with the better teams. You know, you got Al- in addition to Alabama, you got LSU, Florida, Auburn, uh, Mississippi State, Georgia, all those teams. Whereas in the ACC, our next best, our second best team to Clemson is Syracuse. Yeah, and it's, you know, and and although the, the, and Miami has a legacy, but they haven't been prominent since what two thousand three. It's been yeah. a long time since mm-hmm. I think they won a title or even competed for one. Um, but this was a game sort of to um, start out the career of Manny Diaz, uh, the new head coach for Miami, um, going up against Florida, a very inconsistent team last year, a team that has a lot of high hopes uh, that always get crushed by Georgia yeah. or Alabama. They're um, always a team that they, they've struggled on the offensive side of the ball for a, a few years now. Pretty much since Tebow left, they've yeah. been struggling on the offense forever. And, I mean, the struggles continued for them on the offensive side of the ball with Felipe Franks, uh, who last year and the year before I think got benched a total of five times. Wow. Um, But somehow manages to keep coming back, did not have a great night. 
Um, he went 17 of 27, 254 yards, two touchdowns, and two picks, one of which was almost game-ending um, that I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, but this game was just sloppy. It was extremely sloppy. Um, we knew going in that the Miami offensive line would be bad because it's three freshmen, mm-hmm. and we knew that Florida would be very inconsistent but very stout on defense. Um, and both of those th- – all, all, every prediction came true, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Um, the Miami offensive line was absolutely atrocious, especially oh, yeah. when you have a, a freshman, a true freshman quarterback starting. He seemed very uncomfortable, especially towards the end of the game. He was looking like frantic, and he was looking to get out of the pocket as soon as he saw like any sort of pressure come his way. He he wasn't looking to step up, and I don't blame him. But like, you yeah. can't trust that. Offensive line after the way they played that game. No, I mean, I wish he scrambled more or, or did some rollouts. I mean, yeah. I, you can sort of blame the the coaching staff for not really um, gauging some changes that need to be made, um, especially after halftime because at halftime there were like four or five sacks already, which is way too many, you know, for any team in any game. Um, but two freshman tackles, a freshman center, um, you're going to have issues. And the Florida defensive ends just absolutely demolished the pocket. And I feel bad for the Miami quarterback, Jaron Williams. He had a good stat night, 19 of 30, 214 yards, a touchdown. Um, also, But the thing is, he had 14 rushes for negative 44 yards and a QBR of 17.1 out of 100. Wow. So even though his passing stats look pretty good, the the sacks just absolutely killed him and it's unfortunately well actually fortunately for him it's not entirely his fault i blame yeah. it mainly on the o line and the uh, the coaching however miami could have won this game they had a chance they had a shot there at the end and they got lucky they had three pass interference calls <laughs> that went in their favor towards the end of the game one of them was uh taken away which would have been huge cuz it was in the end zone yep. although i know in college it's, it's not 15 it's yards 15, max yeah yeah but still um the fourth and 34 the pass fourth back. it was the 34 34 and they got automatic first down Auto- i mean that's unreal like and that's totally on florida because when you watch it like it is it was a pass interference yep. I, I would say like i mean I, I am a fan of letting the cornerbacks play especially in a fourth and 34 situation like you i don't feel like the offense offense deserves anything that's like close you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. In that case, if it's thrown like five yards away from him, and there's like some hand, you know, batting and stuff, don't throw the flag. Yeah. But this was an obvious one. There was no complaining from the Florida side because yeah. it was pretty obvious. Mm-hmm. But then they got it again. Yeah. And that that set him up, I think, at like the twenty-five mm-hmm. or really close to the red zone. Um, and then they threw another one in the the end zone, but that one was picked up. Yeah. Um, I think the Miami money finally dried up. There. Yeah. At that point, it was like not worth it. Yeah. Um, but to me, it speaks to one. This is definitely college football. You would never see that happen in a professional game. No. At that point, you say, "Let them catch it." Like, who cares? Then you just make the tackle. Um, but it also speaks to the mental fortitude of I think Florida's defense because when something like that happens, when you at, at fourth and thirty-four. No one converts fourth and 34. That's game over. You're getting off the field to then have to relock, refocus, and play one of the, I mean, it's it's a huge drive. It's opening. It's the opening game. Yep. Every, the world is watching you. This is sets the tone for your season. You have to lock in. You have to say, all right, what happened, happened. Whatever. Like, you got to move on. And they were able to do that. But then it happened again. And they still were able to lock in and uh, come out of there with a win. Yep. Uh, hats off to that defense. That was an unbelievable effort. Even though they were going up against a fresh, a true freshman quarterback and pretty much a true, a 60% true freshman offensive line, um, credit has to be given to them because the Florida offense deserves absolutely no credit whatsoever. Um, Felipe Franks was trash-talking the crowd. The entire night, he was punting footballs into the stands on the sideline because I guess he just does that. I, I guess when you get benched five times, you are just you just have all the confidence in the world. Yeah, it seems a little bizarre. It yeah. seems like you should maybe you should check his ego. Just yeah. try and 
you know play the game. So so here I'll give you an example of what happened uh, for for Miami. So they go down, they turn the ball over on downs, and this is with, I think, yeah, with four minutes left to go, fourth quarter. All that Florida has to do is just get maintain a solid drive, throw up four points, you know, game over if they can just run out the clock. First play, throws the ball, picked off. Moron. Yeah, just absolute moron. And then they're just lucky that Miami – Got two huge penalties, one in unsportsmanlike conduct, which is to be expected when, you know, with the University of Miami. Miami, yeah. Of and then another one on the next play with a chop block. <laughs> so it was first and 30. That's why they were in that fourth and 34 yeah. scenario. Because then they get seven yards on a on a nice pass, and then they get sacked for like 10 yards or something. Um, so, yeah, Florida's offense deserves absolutely no credit for this win. It was entirely on the offense or on the defense. Florida had four turnovers, four turnovers, two picks from Franks, another fumble on the goal line for Franks, that that would have put Florida up fourteen to three in the first quarter. Um, I, 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 it's just unbelievable how both teams wanted to lose this game and some team managed to win. Yeah, I mean, it's very rare that you'll see a team be down 4-1 in the turnover column and come out with a win. Um, It is very tough to win football games when you are losing possessions. You you have lost... You are at a negative three uh, in terms of net possessions, right? Like, it it just puts so much pressure on both sides of the ball because the offense doesn't have as many opportunities to put the ball in the end zone. Exactly. It's simple math. Yeah. Our robot listeners can understand that. Yeah, zero one zero 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 one one zero. I yeah. told them. Yeah, it's the math that matters. Mm-hmm. Um, but going into this, um, we're ACC followers. We, we're looking to see what's going on. So let's let's do a brief overview of what we see going on, especially in the ACC Coastal, mm-hmm. as this division, by you know, named by many analysts as one of the most open up divisions in all of college football. Um, going into the season, Miami's projected to win the Coastal and then get their butts pounded upon by Clemson in the ACC oh, championship game. Um, that's nice. So out of the seven teams, um, I think the three best teams in this division are Miami, UVA, and our Virginia Tech Hokies. Um, and I'm not very high on our Hokies this yeah. year. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, like, if you have Virginia Tech in the top three, this division is not exactly strong this year no it, i definitely don't think it is and looking at miami too about how they played last night yes it's the first game of the season yes they're starting a lot of true freshmen but they're going to make a lot more mistakes coming up mm-hmm. in their next few games um although looking at the rest of the division though i the only team i think that can give them a run for their money is uva because they have that um the dual threat uh perkins no. quarterback coming back okay. again yeah um who Virginia sort of likes to live and die by, as we saw in the Commonwealth Cup last year. Mm-hmm. Um, but let's let's take a little bit of a brief prediction of how we think our Hokies are going to do. Uh, let's open up their schedule. So we open up at Boston College, um, an, an ACC rivalry open. Um, so you don't know what's going to happen in this game. We are projected to win. I think the line's like four and a half in our favor. I don't know how, because I think the best player on the field – on this upcoming Saturday is going to be AJ Dillon, the running back for Boston College. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we have a very easy three game stretch, all three games at home. ODU, who we lost to last year, Furman, a, a subdivision team that's not, we don't even compete with, you know, for bowl games, and then at home against Duke. So Duke was all right last year. Is has something changed drastically that has sort of made you so low on them? They were all right. I mean, they're losing some talent. They lost Daniel Jones. Yeah. Um, you know, the almighty Daniel Jones, you know, who David Gettleman, you know, saw and saw that gem in the in the rough and just like, this is our next Eli Manning, I mean quarterback. <laughs> um, so they lose him. So they're having a new quarterback come over and take over. Um, they lose a lot of people on defense as well. So I don't think it's going to be a good year for them. I, I think they'll. I see them going like four and eight, five and seven. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So that's why I'm a little bit low on them. Then you have at Miami for us, which I think is a guaranteed loss. Um, yeah, we play all game. of our rivalry games on the road this year. We play Boston College, Miami, George Tech, and UVA on the road. Um, so after the Miami game, I think we're we're looking at best what four and one if we beat BC. Mm-hmm. Then we got Rhode Island, another subdivision team at home. We have UNC, who's also they have new leadership with Mac Brown, the okay. legendary Texas head coach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although I do think we'll get a win there. So at best, after that, we'll probably be six and one, maybe ranked. You know, maybe the there'll be talks. Oh, can Virginia Tech pull off the comp? Yeah, you know, the Ryan coastal? Willis, next great quarterback to come out of the ACC. <sighs> yeah, and then we get to go lose to Notre Dame in South Bend. Well, you know, <laughs> I bet if we are six and one, they're definitely going to rank us just so it can be two ranked teams against each other. I feel like that's what they do every year. This is how it's been. The Hokies, they start off not ranked, and then they win their, like, shit games, and then they rank us, like, and then we play a team like Clemson, Miami. Well, Old actually, Dominion. We, Old, Old <laughs> Dominion. Um, we play a team against, like, that's competent, and then we just get blasted, <laughs> and then we drop, and we're not ranked anymore. Yeah, that that's a very common theme. It happened against James Madison, you know, a decade ago. Um, but, yeah, that could be a game day game, you know, Virginia Tech at Notre Dame. Although there's probably like an Alabama LSU game that week. Um but yeah, 6 and 2 after Notre Dame. Then we play Wake. I think that's another win. So 7 and 2 at Georgia Tech. They're projecting us to win that game too for some reason. So 8 and 2. They're projecting us to beat Pitt. So Pitt's 9 and 2. Bad, right? Yep. So we should win. We should win. Home. And then they're projecting us to lose to UVA. The first time. The in first what? time in 15 or 16 years. Wow. I mean, you know they're going to be pulling out all the stops to beat UVA. Because or, or is UVA to beat us or us to beat them? Us to beat them. Oh, yeah. Um, It's going to be, man, like, I think we're going to suck this year. I think we will have a winning record just because our schedule is just a breeze. Like, mm-hmm. they put this schedule together because they knew we were going to be god-awful with all the talent that we, like, jettisoned. And then... Bud Foster leaving at the end of the year. Yeah, I think we had like 10 or 11 transfers out. Yeah. It was ridiculous how many we had leave. You know, it's crazy because um, with the our basketball team, the amount of talent that we lost uh, this past year, I would say our basketball team has significantly more prospects and like potential than... We got two four-star guards. Yeah. Mike Young's actually doing a really good he, job recruiting. He, he's locked in and he's... I think Virginia Tech, I mean, I know we're talking about football right now, but I think you might start seeing a shift. I mean, football is always, always going to dominate yeah. in terms of like money-wise and like the popular, like what people go and see because the tailgates. Lane Stadium is historic. Yeah. It, we have the history. They can fill more people in Lane Stadium than yeah. Castle. Yeah. But I think like sports fans, when they think of Virginia Tech, if they – really are fans they're going to start thinking basketball first in the in in the coming you know five ten years yeah i know and it's it's insane um but i like that i like the shift to basketball especially if if fuente can't get it together because i think he's in the hot seat you do i was going to ask you like because um you know he came in you know obviously following frank beamer is a difficult task exactly yeah right and i want to cut him some slack for that but it seems like I mean our freshman year we had um, Gerard Evans, Gerard Evans, who led us to a pretty uh, good uh, you know bowl win. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a very good comeback victory, right? Versus yeah, against Arkansas. Arkansas yep. Um, and that was the peak. I mean, we thought okay, we transitioned from Frank Beamer to Fuente, and we you know we weren't competing for you know the championship, but. We won a good bowl game against a pretty good team. We, we almost a, beat Clemson. Yeah, it was. It was. There was some promise. There was some potential looking uh, into the future, and now it just seems like Bud Foster leaving. All these guys wanting out. Apparently, I mean, is it a problem with Fuente? Is it a problem with the organization generally? Like, just like people don't see us as a place to like develop talent to make it to the NFL. I I think that's been a big thing, especially on the offensive side. Because yeah. one of the reasons why we brought Fuente in, because everybody thought he was a quarterback guru. Yeah. Because at Memphis, he he 
helped he he helped develop Paxton Lynch to become a great quarterback there, even though he sucks <laughs> in the NFL. Paxton Lynch. Um, so I think we jumped the gun on him a little bit because I haven't seen any good quarterbacks, um, develop. Like we can't really say Gerard L- uh, Evans developed here cause he only played a year. Yeah. Mainly his own fault cause he left because he's stupid. He thought he could make it in the NFL. He, yeah. he made it on a practice. He made it on the Eagles. Eagles. Yeah. And then and they I cut don't him. think he's on a team. No. Yeah. I mean, that's just stupid in my opinion. Like take some time to, you know, work on yourself. Like what are you trying to do? Yeah. He would have had a, we, the, his next year would have been great. Yeah, like we, we would have had. A, I, I think we would have still had Isaiah Ford, mm-hmm. um, Cam Phillips, all those guys. Chris Cunningham, mm-hmm. Bucky Hodges. Yeah, um, we would have had all those great receivers. We would have had most of our O line coming back. That would have been our year. Yeah, that offensive team was pretty good. I mean, it wasn't perfect, but you know the dual threat, and you know he could throw the ball downfield. Isaiah Ford was a fantastic outside receiver; like he could go up and get it mm-hmm. exactly what you want from your wide receiver one. Um, but it seems like we're kind of back to our uh, grind it out, sort of just get whatever beamer ball sort of mentality. Just yeah, but we don't even have a good defense anymore. Yeah, it's so now we have nothing. Yeah, it, the, the, we have no identity, which mm-hmm. is unfortunate because. Back in the days of Beamer, it was Beamer ball. It was defense. It was hard-nosed, hard-pressed, in-your-face defense. And then special teams. You know how most teams like to play second or third string on special teams? Yeah. Beamer played first string defense on special teams yeah. back in the 90s and the early 2000s and stuff. Because he wanted to instill a culture of just like, let's win the game on every single play. On punts, on kickoffs on field goals, on everything. Get our best players out there. That's why we had so many blocks, and it really improved the culture of Virginia Tech. And that's what brought us up to prominence, especially in the late 90s, early 2000s. And you, you don't see that anymore. There, there's no... I, I don't see any real spirit there on the team. I yeah. mean, like especially with Ryan Willis as, as our quarterback. I mean, I, I guess we'll go with him. I, I mean... I just feel like we're wasting a lot of the talent that we have um, with our other two quarterbacks that sit on the bench. And I am all for pocket passing quarterbacks. I like those quarterbacks more usually. Yeah. But I, I just think the other two guys have more talent and they may leave. They may go through the transfer portal. Yeah. And then, I, I think in college too, like you can afford to run a dual threat quarterback if you have a good athletic talent. I think it works more in college because guys just aren't athletic as athletic on the defensive end. You might have one or two guys, maybe three or four, if you're a really good defensive team that are going to make it to the NFL. Uh, and with that, like you can have a guy if, on the place quarterback. They can also run the ball because they're going to be able to outrun a lot of guys. Um, so I don't mind the dual threat quarterback in a college uh, setting. I think Virginia tech has done it well in the past with uh, Gerard Evans and then um, go- Tyrod Taylor. Uh, yeah. Um, um, Josh Jackson, Josh Jackson recently, and then Michael Vick, obviously Marcus mm-hmm. Vick, you know, back in the day. Yeah. Um, but I think the Boston College game will be a litmus test for for Ryan Willis because the defense won't be as shit as they were last year. Mm-hmm. Because I think most of the blame can be thrown on the defense last year as just being god awful. Yeah. This year it's going to be on him if he doesn't show results in Boston College um, or ODU the next game. I I think you go to the bench. And, yeah. and and just start, you know, it tryouts again, really. Yeah. Because, what, are we really going to lose to ODU again? Are we really going to lose to Furman or Duke? I mean, we could lose to Duke. Mm-hmm. But I don't see us losing to Furman, at least. Yeah. It, it, it would be embarrassing to come out and not go 4-0 or at least 3-1. and one. If we are 2-2 two and two after Duke, that is an embarrassment to Virginia Tech basketball. Mm-hmm. Or because football. Football, yeah. sorry. Um, it's th- This is such a cakewalk of a schedule yeah. we have this year. It's the easiest schedule of all Power 5 teams. Yeah. Easiest schedule. And it's not even close. Like, yeah. we were we're lucky to have a ranked team on there. Because mm-hmm. Miami's going to drop down, and in, in I don't think they're going to get any votes next week. Um, I don't. UVA could lose to Pitt this week. Um, so, I, I don't know what could happen, but... Hopefully we get this win against Boston College. It's a rivalry game. We better be ready to go and play. Yeah. Because 
If not, it's going to be a long season. Yeah, it's not going to be fun to watch. You're going to be counting down the days till uh, uh, basketball. Yeah, can't wait for that. <laughs> oh, my God. But anyway, let's let's wrap up this segment and go to our favorite segment, Who Fouled Out? Raymond, I'll start with you. Who fouled out for you this week? I got Martinez. Um, David Martin- Martinez, the coach uh, or the manager of the Washington Nationals. They went 12-2. and two. I thought you were really high on them. Why do you have him fouling out? Well, they lost two games, right? Okay? Right? Yes, you understand that. I understand they lose. Look, you know, they have twelve and two is a is a good record. I'm not gonna say, oh, you have to go fourteen and zero, and you have to be perfect, win every single game for me to be happy. I'm very happy with with this the way this team is playing right now, and I think every player should be proud of how they have conducted themselves and the way they've rallied together and built this culture of you know having fun but also winning. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't think Davey Martinez is a god-awful manager. I just think he makes decisions that are not the decisions of a person that is going to win this team a World Series. He puts in... Oh, so let me give you some context. Uh, one to zero. One zero. One zero, right? Against the Pirates. Pretty, no offense, but pretty bad team. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Strasburg, you know, works his ass off pitches a great game a gem i think he had given up two hits at that point um just absolutely fantastic game in line for his 16th win and then martinez you know how he rewards him puts in the suero to pitch the uh eighth inning i believe are you kidding me so doolittle's on the aisle i get that you know got to give the guy some rest he's he's had some rough outings here recently you got strickland Dumbass broke his nose on benching weights. Okay, fine. Hudson, you want to pitch him in the ninth? Perfectly understandable. Rodney has been pitching very well for you. You know, this is actually kind of poor phrasing now because he just blew up uh, against the Cubs today. But from an objective standpoint, Rodney has been your guy in the eighth inning since uh, the acquisition of Strickland and Hudson. Or... More or less. They, they've kind of been interchangeable. They've done Strickland Hudson 7-8. They've done Strickland Rodney 7-8. They've done, I think they did Rodney Hudson once as well. But it was always to get to Doolittle. But you want to pitch Doolittle in the ninth. I mean, Hudson in the ninth. Rodney, given a clean inning, has been very, very, very good uh, in the last month or so. And that was exactly what he would have. Instead, you pitch Suero in his 5.0 ERA. I just don't understand from a management perspective why that's something you would go with. And then on top of that, he pulls out um, he pulls out Suero after he's having a bad inning and puts and bases in Hudson. are loaded. Yeah. yeah. And Hudson is a pitcher. He knows how to pitch. He has been very good. He has a 3.0 ERA overall. He's been very good on the Nationals since the acquisition. Um But when you do that, you force the guy to throw strikes. It's bases loaded. What is he supposed to do? And Hudson is a guy, he likes to work work the count. Um, He likes to move guys around with his uh, pitch location. You can't do that when you're put put in a situation where the bases are loaded and you have to throw strikes. What do you think is going to happen? And it gives up a dinger. Like, it just seems to me that Martinez doesn't know his bullpen. He doesn't have... He hasn't given his bullpen an identity, and he doesn't understand where to use guys at any given situation. And this isn't entirely on Martinez. It is very hard to manage this bullpen. Out, you know, Strickland and Hudson were admittedly good acquisitions. Doolittle has been struggling as of late, but generally, you know, he's your ninth inning guy. There isn't much to it. You pitch him in the ninth if you're in a safe situation, and you don't otherwise. Um, so I understand it's hard, but. You gotta, you just gotta give your guys roles and let them execute those roles. And you lose games when you don't give them roles and you don't let them execute. You know what I'm saying? Oh uh, yeah, I definitely understand it. And I mean, the Pirates up to that point were absolutely just trashed. Strasburg did an amazing job of just shutting everybody down. And we had at the time, I think, three players that he was going up against that had over 300 batting average. Mm-hmm. Um. So it's a shame that Strauss had to lose that win. Um, and I, I think he did give up – the guy did give up a dinger, but 
but I think he gave up a base hit before, and then he gave up a three-run home run. Yeah. Um, and the, the Pirates ended up winning that game 4-1 to in a game that they definitely did not deserve to win. Mm-hmm. Um, just sort of, you know, Danny, Davey Martinez sort of just like, here you go. Here's, here's you know, this, this will get you to, what, 50 wins, you know, on yeah. the season? <laughs> there you go, buddy. Yeah. Um, but that is very unfortunate for them and I think could come back to haunt them later on. But for me, this week, um, I watched the entire Miami-Florida game last night. The Miami O-line is trash. I have them fouling out. Oh yeah, they looked awful. I I I think I don't think I've ever seen a game like an actual college football game live that's not a video game where one team has given up ten sacks. Yeah, I think the, the in a professional game, I think the Jaguars got sacked ten times last year or something. I I can't remember. But I then think. again, if you're a Jaguars O line, why would you want to protect Blake Bortles? Yeah, that's fair. Like See, he's a total asshole. Yeah, there you go. But like this guy, th- this. Uh, Jaron Williams guy who started true freshman made was making great throws when he was given time to throw. Uh, it's just unfortunate, and I understand that these guys are freshmen and they're they're learning, and I feel bad sort of throwing them under the best uh, bus and putting them on um, as my fouling out uh, candidate. But to me, you, you ten sacks, ten. Mm-hmm. And and they're and they're saying like you're gonna be the team to beat or uh, to play Clemson in the ACC championship. Uh, uh-uh, I don't think so. If that continues, yeah. if that continues, UVA and definitely Virginia Tech will beat them. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have them fouling out this week. There, I've never seen a team give up ten sacks. Do you see any improvement down oh, the line? Of course, this is rock bottom for these guys. Of so they, there's no one got nowhere to go but up. Oh yeah, nowhere to go back uh, but up. I mean, maybe against Cle- they do play Clemson this year, and I think. They'll probably give up like six or seven sacks, but they'll they'll learn. They'll figure it out. Mm-hmm. I mean, I Manny Diaz is a new coach. Um, he didn't really show a whole lot of adjustments, but you know, people adjust over time. People figure themselves out and how to to coach their team. So I'll definitely give them the benefit of the doubt. And even though I hate Miami, um, I think they will get better over okay. time. Um, I guess that brings us to three big questions. All right. Do you want me to go first? Do you want to ask you the first question, or do you sure. want to go? I'll all let right. you go first. All, yeah, all right, Ladies so. first. Well, look, hopefully our robots can parse our gender um, mm-hmm. of choice. It's John. To see that you're wrong. Wrong. Well, uh, oh, 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 no. Fuck. <laughs> We've summoned him. Oh, no, no. I don't think. I think it's fine. I don't, I don't sure? see it. I, his rock is gone. Yeah, Rock I mean, is back up in yeah. uh, Northern Virginia. I think we're okay. This he is, usually will come come out of the closet at night. Is what yeah. he usually does. I don't um, think he wants to come out of the closet though. Uh, I think yeah. only when like really, really summoned. Mm-hmm. But hopefully, we can keep the those outbursts to a minimum. Uh, yes. Yeah. Especially with season, you know, starting you know, lucky season two. Yeah. <laughs> How far? This is our first big question. Uh-huh. How far do the Nats go in the playoffs? I think they, if they go up against, I think they'll end up going up against the Mets. It'll be DeGrom versus Scherzer. I think they can win that game. I think it'll be close, but I love the way Rendon has played this year. He is absolutely ice cold. Cabrera, their new pickup. Astrub. Astrub, (laughs) as they call him. I hope they don't call him that, but if they do, Astrubal Cabrera. Um, great pickup. He played on the Nats uh, back in 2016, 17, I believe. Um, and they picked him up as a free agent. Kind of struggled this year. Been fantastic for the Nats. I think he's got 14, 15 RBIs in like 12, 13 games. Trey Turner, obviously. Trey Turner has been a great leadoff man. They're, the top of their order is very productive. Um, and I think if they can grind, they've been grinding out at bats and that's what you need to do. The Grom is not going to give you a lot of runs. He'll give you one, maybe two. Um, so what you have to do is grind out every at bat. Don't just swing it. The first strike you see, you got to get to that bullpen and then do damage from there. And that's what the Mets are going to, going to try to do to Scherzer. It's going to be, I think that game will be decided by whoever goes to their bullpen first. Um, and then after that, they're going to play the Dodgers. I don't see them beating the Dodgers, unfortunately. I I think the Nets are a good team this year. I think they could win a series against the Braves. Win their first ever playoffs. Yeah, they could win their first. If they played the Braves in the postseason, I think they would 
absolutely win that series. I would put them over the Braves. And I think they beat whoever comes out of the Central. Um, but they're going to get the wild card, and they're going to play the Dodgers, and they're going to lose. Um, so that's how far I have them going. All right. That's pretty fair. Pretty fair. Um, for you, so we talked about Andrew Luck at the top of the show. Mm-hmm. Kind of cap it off here as well. So Andrew Luck, going to be the one of the biggest what-ifs in uh this of this decade you know, there's a lot of players whose career have been cut short due, due to injury but andrew luck was truly a special talent mm-hmm. um yep and you know he's a guy that you thought would win super bowls end up in the hall of fame that's kind of what my question is would andrew luck have been in the hall of fame if his career was you know he actually had a full career and he wasn't screwed over due to piss poor management and coaching yeah i it's hard to say no it is really hard to say no. This guy was seemed destined for greatness, and as you mentioned earlier, he was just getting into what is you know sort of known as like the quarterback prime. You know, your late twenties, early thirties, when you sort of have command of your team. Yep. Um, you have relationships with your O line, your offensive coordinator, your receivers, maybe. Um, and it, it's just it's an it's an honest shame, really. It, it's such terrible. Um, way to, to have played out because 23,000 yards in only really four, like five and a third seasons, you know, five and a half seasons, really. Yeah, that's it's all close he played. to 5,000 yards a season. <sighs> it, that, it's really sad. Uh, his completion per- percentage, 60%. Very good. He threw a lot of picks, obviously, um, when especially in the years when he got injured and years when he was first starting, but he was the comeback player of the year last year. Led them to a wild card playoff game, ah, and an AFC Championship game one year against the Patriots, in which obviously they got blown out. Uh, but it was only because the footballs were deflated. If the footballs were properly inflated, the Colts would have easily won that game. Yeah. So don't even fucking start with that <laughs> bullshit. The Patriots are a bunch of cheaters. They don't deserve any Super Bowls. Take them all away. You said you you said it, dude. I I I was gonna say that, but you know you took the words right out of my mouth. Sorry, I just get really triggered when people talk about the oh, Patriots. Okay, sorry, my bad. Um. But yeah, it, and it's it's so you look at how they managed him. Let, let's start at how they managed Andrew Luck with just all the injuries that he had, all the pain, all the rehab. They they didn't even take him out some years because they knew like holy shit, we ain't starting whoever's behind him. Yeah, like and and the rest of the team ain't gonna pull their weight either. Um, so they they played him injured, like especially in what twenty fifteen. Oh yeah, in 2016 it was when he got really injured and they couldn't play him. He had he a lacerated kidney. He played a game with a lacerated <sighs> kidney. He had to play a game with a punctured lung and a broken rib. I mean, he was playing very injured a lot of games. Yeah, and and then look at just look at what the management surrounded him with. So first of all, they poorly managed Andrew Luck himself. They poorly managed the team around him. Who of note did they draft on the offensive side or defensive side that has had any weight or any influence on this team? Name one good running back that they drafted since 2012. Name one good receiver that they've drafted. I mean, Hilton's good. Did they draft him? They did draft Hilton, so I'll I'll give them Hilton. Hilton was probably the best pick they've made. But, like, yeah, I agree. O-line, tight end. O-line, awful. You know. uh, Their defense has been a shit show. They're like Swiss cheese ever since they got luck. Yeah, and I mean, like, I I like to shit on the Pittsburgh Steelers' defense as of late, but holy cow, the the Colts' defense is way worse, and it's been yeah. way worse for decades. I mean, do you remember Jonas Gray? Do you remember that name? Yeah, 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 from the Four Patriots. Four touchdowns he rushed for. Never did anything in the NFL ever again, and that was against the Colts' run defense, which is awful, just yeah. truly pitiful. Dwight Freeney, that was the name that kept coming back to me in my head. They drafted him way before luck. And they, they were lucky to have him for as long as they did. He was a defensive end for him. Yeah. Like, when, when that's the biggest name on your defense, and, and then your defense is bottom five every year, it, it, it's terrible management. They, they I haven't seen them make any moves in free agency. We like to shit on teams like the Redskins for making too many moves, but it's worse when you don't make any moves in the free agent market. You just let guys walk out the door. You, yeah, you just let talent walk off, you know, get out of there. And and still, it, I'll, I'll get to that final point. And then you look at the overall management. You know, you have Jim Ursay, 
caught with you know beer in his car, got a DUI. You yeah. know, Chuck Pagano. Another Chuck Pagano coach. sucks. I can't believe they stuck around with him for so long. Uh, who's just an ass coach? Yeah. Um. That that didn't that couldn't get anything together. No semblance of good game plans or anything. And still, still, Andrew Luck gave you the first three seasons, three back to back eleven and five seasons. Yeah. And then this last season, a ten and six season. After coming back after a year of not playing, mm-hmm. I, I the Colts management is completely to blame here. It was I feel so bad for these fans, even though they did boo him off the field after the press conference. Yeah, I, I hate that. that was but ridiculous. these fans deserve way more. You know, after the Pacers have started to get a little, you know, they've had to go through the whole Paul George saga. Mm-hmm. You know, now they have to go through Andrew Luck. Yeah. Oh, it's such a damn shame because he would have been a Hall of Famer and probably, I would say, at least one time Super Bowl champ. Yeah. Probably two. Can you believe also, like, you talk about winning Super Bowls. The Colts with Peyton Manning only won one Super Bowl. Yeah, because they, again, no defense. They they couldn't manage to build around them. Yeah. it's it's. An, I mean, like, Drew Brees did, they did go to two Super Bowls. Yeah. I'll give them that. But like, their their defense wasn't great, mm-hmm. and and I mean like they're running. They've never really had a great running game. No. Frank Gore, you know. Yeah, Frank Gore's good, but like he by the time he went to the Colts, he was a little past his prime. Although with Frank Gore, it's sort of just like continuous. Like he'll give you like seven hundred yards a season. He will never not run for seven hundred yards or whatever. Um, but he's not a flashy running no. back. Um, but yeah. I mean, Cole's pretty much just like, what the heck? They man? done effed up. They yeah. done effed up. And this should, like I said, this should be a warning to teams looking like the Texans. You know, even though, I mean, the Rams made the Super Bowl this year, right? Mm-hmm. They did. I think the Rams did the right thing. They brought in a ton of talent around their quarterback who they thought was special. And it, it did get them to a Super Bowl. They haven't won a Super Bowl yet, but they built a good team. Mm-hmm. They went out and got the pieces that they needed. They made the trades. They made the free agency signings. Um, but then you look at the Texans, O-line, w- like what's happening? Yeah, poor Deshaun Watson's getting sacked five times a game. Mm-hmm. Uh, same warning can go for the Packers and the Chiefs um, because, yes, the Chiefs do have a lot of offensive weapons, but that defense needs improved. Well, the offensive weapons are the you know, Tyreek Hill and Kareem Hunt. I yeah, mean, are also beating up their, you yeah. know, committing d- domestic violence. Which they can't control, yeah. obviously. The Chiefs, you can't control that. But still, like, you got to figure that out. But luckily, Andy Reid is a very, very competent coach. Um, Except for time management. He sucks at that. Yeah, he cannot manage the clock to save his life. Um, but yeah, our after this question, you usually think we have another question coming. But of course. it's a twist. It's a season two new twist. We are doing a college football pick for this first week, mm-hmm. just for practice, sort of like an exhibition one. Yeah. And then we'll be doing for every next week, or every week after, I don't know why I said every next week, Dumbass. we will be doing an NFL pick and we will rank and, and, and see how we go after we've made our picks to mm-hmm. see how we've done. So, and the loser at the end, what does he have to do? Um, if nobody gets skunked in a game of pong, the loser at the end of the NFL regular season, mm-hmm. regular season, yeah. has to drink that nasty bush that I found on the ground outside. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Sounds good to me. All right. So to open up, uh, we'll start this weekend off with college football and the biggest game this weekend, Oregon versus Auburn. Number 11, Oregon versus number 16, Auburn. Um, This game is being played in Jerry World, so it's a neutral site for both teams. Oregon has a lot of high hopes coming in with Justin Herbert uh, coming off a pretty good freshman year, although Oregon is expecting a lot more from this year. They they think that they can make a big push to the college football playoff. Auburn uh, coming off after uh, losing their quarterback to the draft, um, losing also a lot of talent um, to the draft as well on defense. Um, still come in ranked 16th and the favorites in this game, even though Oregon has a higher rank. Um, Gus Malzahn still there, although sort of feeling some pressure in the hot seat um, for not really getting the job done as of late. Um, who do you? Who are you taking? I'll, I'll pass this one to <clears> you <throat> first. Well, from my analysis, you know, 
Oregon, very good team. You know, they got Chip Kelly at quarterback. Marcus Mariota, it, it looks... <laughs> Chip sorry. Kelly at quarterback? <laughs> sorry, fuck. I already fucked up the joke. Chip Kelly at head coach. Marcus Mariota, it looks like to be an incredible talent. I bet like a team, I don't know, like the Titans or someone would love to have them on their a team at quarterback. Um, so from that, I, you know, I just got to go with Oregon. You know, How can you not with a guy like Mariota at the helm? I hate to say this, and I hate to go against what Vegas is telling me because the line is three and a half. I'm gonna take. I'm gonna go with Oregon. Actually, I switched my pick. I pick Auburn Shut now. Shut up! No, you're with Oregon. No, I switch it. No, you don't. Are are you actually switching? or Are you going with Oregon? Yeah, I switched my pick to Auburn. Okay, well, fine. You can be an asshole. Yep. All right, so I'm going with the Ducks on this one. Raymond is going with Auburn. I believe in Justin Herbert, the actual starting quarterback for mm. Oregon. Mario just hurt this week, of course. How can All I right. Forget? Well, you know what? You can just shut up, and we cannot do this next. <laughs> <laughs> you lost your picking privilege. <clears throat> next game, the Chick Fil A kickoff game, and I don't know how these two teams got paired up to start off the actual week one of college football. But Duke versus Alabama, number mm-hmm. two Alabama, and unranked Duke. I don't know why Chick Fil A thought this would be a good pairing. Mm, it's I a guess spicy chicken sandwich. Maybe I guess to get the Alabama views. Um, mm-hmm. Alabama comes into it, or Duke comes into this game as 35 and a half point underdogs. Hey. This game is being played in Atlanta mm-hmm. in the new stadium, uh, the new Falcon Stadium. Never tell me the odds, brother. This is the, the Duke without Daniel Jones, who's mm-hmm. now playing on the Giants. I don't know who David Cutliffe is going to put in there as starting quarterback. And Nick Saban coming out there with uh, all American talent with Tua Tagovailoa. And All American receiver Jerry Judy, who's projected to possibly be a potential number one draft pick. Um, so I obviously have Alabama here, although I do want to support my ACC. Duke's just going to get pounded. Ah, uh, fook Duke. I got Alabama. All right. So we're in consensus here with Alabama. Yeah. This seems like a. A trap game for Alabama. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Shut up. All right. Moving on to our final game, and this will be a trend going, you know, well, that's, this will be a, this won't be a trend going forward since this is our only week doing college football. Pick-up. Well, we could mix it up. We could do some NFL, some college, just oh, if it's yeah, a good we, game. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, we'll if do... it's a good game, we'll do whatever. Cool. Yeah. I, but I like the three game. Yeah, pick-up. do it three. We have a thing with threes, three big question, three games, you know. All right. Final game. Three of us. You, me, and, you know, yeah, who's in the closet. You, you know who. We, we, we don't want to disturb yeah, him. Yeah, okay. We want to keep him silent. He's de- he's dealing with China and tariffs right now. Okay. Busy man. Virginia Tech versus Boston College. Virginia Tech comes into this, as we uh, stated, with uh, Ryan Willis at the helm. Um, their defense comes back after being the worst defense in the past, I think, three decades of Virginia mm-hmm. Tech football. You know what's crazy, though? What is crazy? Ryan Willis is the quarterback for... <laughs> Uh, Virginia Tech, right? Yeah, still. So, so yeah, Ryan Willis. That Ryan is his first name, obviously. But then on Boston College, the last name of the quarterback's name is Ryan. Matt Ryan, our good friend for Boston College. All right. Yes. Our yes, that is true. Matt Ryan is still playing in college, <laughs> and he's what thirty-two <laughs> years old. <laughs> he got held back a few years. Uh, you're, you're also bringing back bad memories of him beating us. Um, but Tech comes into this as four and a half point underdogs. The reason why I don't know. Vegas just sets the line. Um, but we do have um, pretty much everybody coming back on defense, um, except some that transferred out, like Trayvon Hill, that uh, played in Miami last or uh, yesterday. Boston College comes back with AJ Dillon, their All American running back, who probably will be the best player on the field uh, Saturday afternoon. Um, I'm going with my Hokies. I just, okay. I, I got a hope for them this, this week. It's a rivalry game. Hopefully we'll be pumped up to win this one. Wh- who do you got? Um, that's a tough question because my heart tells me to go with Virginia Tech, but my mind tells me that Virginia Tech is going to be uh crap. So, you know, but I got to listen to my heart for week one. You got to have the hope. You got to hold on hope. So I'm going to go with the Virginia Tech Hokies. All right, so in this preseason exhibition, John and Raymond pick them. I've got the Ducks, you have Auburn, we both have Alabama, and we both have Virginia Tech. What if we just pick the same team every single week, and then we'll tie, and then no one has to drink the Bushes light? 
Or then we both have to drink it. Oh, fuck. You cut out the bottom and start shotgunning it. I pop the top and, like, try and suck it up. Yeah, and then I'll get your backwash and you'll get my backwash. And then we'll be backwash brothers for life. And that's how you get AIDS, ladies and gentlemen. And that's how you end the season two, episode one. There we go, brother. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen and computer parts for listening to this mm-hmm. season opener of Fallen Out. That's all we've got from here. Do you have any closing remarks for our, v- or our listeners? Um, fuck the Colts. Ha ha. Go Pats. See you later. All right. Have a good one, guys.